Hi, this is SynthChaser from SynthChaser.com. Over the last few videos, we've been working on this ARP Quadra. We've done a lot of uh, work to get to this point. Um, I've changed all the polarized capacitors throughout the synthesizer. I've changed many of the IC chips. I've removed, disassembled, and cleaned and restored all the sliders. I pulled the key bed and changed the bushings, cleaned the key contacts, leveled the key bed. I've replaced the touch sensor strip, I've cleaned all the switches. Um, and in the last video, we fired it up, and unfortunately, it was not working. It's just not responsive. One light here is on, and nothing is responsive. So in this video, we're going to get the Quadra up and running. So the first thing I'd like to do is uh, verify that all the voltages are correct on the power supply. So I'm opening the keyboard back up. And um, since it's kind of messy down here, I'm actually going to probe um, a little higher up where the power gets distributed to the boards that use the power. So most of our power rails can be found entering these two boards here. So we're going to, uh, to check this out at these connectors where, where they're exposed right here. So first we're going to look at the 5 volts coming into this board here. And we have 5.002 volts, which is fine. Uh, we're going to look at the minus 12 coming into this board. And we're at minus 12 on the nose. And we're going to look at plus 12. And we've got 12.02, so we're good. Let's check the other 5 volt rail, which, come, which comes in up here. So we will check this out, 5.033. Uh, so it looks like all our power rails are, are uh, present and stable. There's no short on any of these boards that's dragging the power supply down. So with that out of the way, we can do a little more detailed troubleshooting. So we're not able to change the state of any of these LEDs using the membrane panel buttons. And this is a job of the CPU, the microcontroller board. So that kind of gives us an area that we can focus on initially. So this board is the microcontroller board, which has the CPU chip, the memory, and a bunch of other chips. And if you recall in the, in the previous video, uh, we changed all the TTL and CMOS chips on this board. The only thing that we left in place that was original were the port expanders, the memory, and the CPU chip itself. So, um, we can pretty much rule out anything that we've changed as, as being at fault. So we're going to start by taking a look at the CPU chip itself. So here's the relevant part of the schematic, uh, and it shows the CPU, which is an Intel 8048 CPU. And uh, basically the first thing that we're going to look at is we're going to make sure that the CPU is getting power, so the VDD and VCC pins are properly powered with 5 volts that our ground is sitting at ground, that the EA, which is used for uh, programming and verifying the ROM on, on board, is grounded. Uh, and then we're going to take a look at the reset signal to make sure that, that uh, that's going high, um, so the CPU should be in a running state. And then finally we're going to go over here and we're going to look at the crystal to make sure that we have a, uh, a clock signal present on the CPU. So I'm going to go verify those pins that I just mentioned. The first one I'm going to look at is ground. Ground is sitting at zero volts there. I'm set to five volts per division, so um, we should be seeing pretty much everything should, should be either sitting at ground or at five volts because this is a digital circuit. Um, we're going to check that EA line to make sure that that's grounded. So that was pin seven, and that is sitting at ground. And now we're going to check the power uh, lines. So VCC is pin 40, and VCC is correctly sitting at uh, 5 volts. Uh, VDD is at pin 26. So that's 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. And that is correctly sitting at 5 volts. So power is good. Let's take a look at the reset signal. So that's here on pin 4. So the reset line is high and the CPU should be in a running state. Let's go take a look at the crystal. So we've got a 6 megahertz clock on this guy. So on one side we see this. On the other side of the crystal we see this. Um, 
not totally stable, um, but the uh, there is a clock signal present there, and uh, and that should be okay. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to see if we have any activity on our data or address buses. So first I'm going to take a look at the uh, data bus. So that starts at pin 12, is the, bit, the lowest bit 0, and the highest bit's on pin 19. So I'm just going to actually start on pin 19 and count backwards. So there's pin 19, and it seems to be sitting around 1 volt with no movement. 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, and 12. So there's no activity on our data bus, and the data bus is, is sitting around 1 volt. So um, that uh, kind of indicates that the CPU might not be alive. So let's take a look at the I.O. ports. That's kind of like the, uh, the address bus, per se, of the CPU. So we're going to take a look here at uh, port 2, which drives the uh, uh, membrane panel, which isn't running. So we're going to start at pin 21, and we're going to take a look at the, uh, the, seven, the 8 bits there. So there's, there's no activity there. Bit 2, 3... Four, five, six, seven, eight. Saw so something. Yeah, that that one's high, but but there's there's no activity there. So again, looking like the CPU is 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 not not working so well. From the data sheet of the eighty forty eight, we see that there's a, a line A L E on pin eleven. Address latch enable. It says this signal occurs once each clock cycle and is useful as a clock output. So if our CPU is in fact alive, we should be seeing some, some, uh, some toggling. Uh, we should see a clock output here on pin 11 regardless of the rest of the circuit. So basically you power the CPU up, give it a clock, make sure it's not reset, and you should be getting a clock output on this ALE. So let's take a look at that. So ALE is on pin 11, so there's 8, 9, 10, 11. And uh, we are sitting at 1 volt-ish. A little bit over 1 volt, and we're not moving. So uh, basically now we've confirmed that this CPU chip is not operational. And it's unfortunate that this CPU chip isn't working because it's not just a plain Jane CPU chip that you can pop another one in. Uh, these 8048s have MaskROM, which was programmed at the factory, and it contains the firmware for the Quadra. So uh, this could be a problem. So since we suspect that this CPU chip is dead or, or misbehaving, I've pulled it out of the keyboard and I have taken a CPU chip from another one of my ARP Quadras. Um, this is just one of three Quadras that I have and this is the only one right now with any kind of restoration underway. So I've quote unquote borrowed a CPU chip or stolen a CPU chip from another Quadra and we'll see if that's any better than this. So let's fire it up and see what we got. So things are looking pretty good. Um, I can toggle the uh, membrane switches. I'm getting sound out of it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through it now and kind of see what's working and what's not working and we'll figure out where we stand. So I've had a chance to look things over and uh, I've noticed a few problems. So uh, starting with the bass section. So the bass section uh, runs on these lower two octaves. And as you can see, we're getting the same note all the way down to here where it stops any notes on these keys here. Uh, so that's, that, that's a problem with the bass section. On the lead synth section, um, one problem is uh, that the VCA never seems to be closing, so the note can 
sustains forever. And uh, as you can see also randomly, we get a really low note coming in instead of uh, the note that we're actually pressing. Uh, one other thing is uh, VCO1 doesn't, doesn't seem to be working at all. So this is just VCO2 that we're hearing. When I turn VCO2 off, we don't hear anything. So we're going to try to bang these issues out and uh, we're going to start with the bass. Um, you'll recall that the Quadra uses a true VCO for the, uh, the bass section as well as the, uh, the two VCOs of the uh, lead synthesizer. So it's possible that we have some control voltage issue. We're not generating the correct control voltage, and that's why I'm constantly getting a low note. Um, and that could also affect the lead synthesizer. So let's check this out first. So I'm going to start down here on this board. This is the keyboard electronics board. And basically, uh, this is the piece that gets scanned by the CPU. You can see there's a ribbon cable here running from the keyboard electronics board up to the microprocessor board and uh, it scans the CPU and it's basically a switch matrix and I've covered switch matrixes in some of my other videos including one where we repaired a switch matrix to an Oberheim OBXA keybed. Uh, so it's possible that perhaps there's some trouble reading the keybed which is why maybe occasionally we get that random low note and why these keys aren't working and why these are always generating the same note. So we're going to take a look down here to start. And here's the relevant schematic. Basically the CPU provides a 3-bit address uh, for a range of keys in the, in the key bed that it wants to scan. And that gets demultiplexed into eight different lines, which enables or disables these tri-state buffers, which either allow or disallow the state of the key to pass onto the data bus, which is then read back to the CPU. So we're going to start here with this chip and just make sure that the CPU is in fact enabling each of those banks of eight keys. There's no enable or disable and there's only the three address bits coming in. So I'd expect one of these uh, lines to be left on when the CPU isn't actively scanning the keypad. Um, but uh, we, we do want to make sure that, that they all eight, all eight of them do get enabled. So then we're going to check out the buffer chips down below. So this is a, a two-state buffer, and this is the tri-state buffer that gets enabled by that demultiplexer. So we'll check those out and uh, see if we can find any explanation for why these keys aren't working. Because if we think about it, the keys, the lower keys that aren't working are all um, go through Z1, uh, Z12, and... Uh, line zero of the demultiplexer. So we're going to see if we can find anything wrong in any of those three areas. So the first thing we're going to check out is the demultiplexer here, the, the 4051 chip. And there's eight lines coming out of that. We're going to check each of those. I'm going to start at the high one, which is line seven. And I can find that on pin four. So pin four. And uh, what we can see here is a uh, it's normally ground with a uh, periodic dip down to uh, negative 15 or sorry negative 12 volts which is what this synth uh, runs on so basically this little blip down is when uh, bank 7 of keys is being scanned by the CPU so we'll move along now to uh, bank 6 which is pin 2 same thing. Bank 5 on pin 5. Bank 4 on pin 1. Uh, we have bank 3, which is on pin 12. Sorry, wrong. There's pin 12. Uh, bank 2 is on pin 15. Bank 1 is on pin 14 and bank 0 is on pin 13. So you can see that the bank uh, 0 is low most of the time and that's fine. It basically when the CPU isn't scanning the keybed 
uh, whatever keys pressed on uh, on bank zero, which is the lowest lowest section of keys, is going to wind up on the data bus, which won't be looked at by the CPU at that time. So that demultiplexer looks to be okay. So the next thing I'm going to check is the uh, first inverter here, right after the physical switch of the key contacts. And we'll take a look at Z2 first, because uh, those keys are working. Then we'll go over and we'll take a look at uh, Z1 for the keys that aren't working. So we're looking at this first stage here. So first we're going to take a look at Z2, and we're going to look at the first, the lowest key that, that we're getting a sound from, which is uh, F sharp. And uh, F sharp, the input to the inverter, or the buffer, sorry, non-inverting buffer, is pin 3. So pin 3, when I hit the key, you see it go low, and when I let go of the key, it goes high. The output is pin 2. So I'm going to hit the key and let go. So the input and the output are the same. Let's take a look at the same thing for Z1. So we're going to look for Z1, the lowest key C, Z1 here, and we'll do pin 3, and I see it go down, and when I let go it goes up. Let's take a look at pin 2. So it looks like Z1 is working. So now that we're pretty sure that this chip is working okay, we're going to move up to the next buffer chip. This one is a tri-state buffer. So uh, basically the enable line, which comes from that demultiplexer chip, uh, will enable this to pass through from 14 to 13. And if it's disabled, then basically this is just high impedance. So it's not going to interfere with anything else that would be on the data bus. So we'll, we'll take a look at this and we'll look, just like before, we'll look at the neighboring chip first for, for how it works and then we'll go and we'll look at, at this chip, uh, Z12. So the interesting thing about this is both Z12 and Z13, which we're going to look at, are run by the same, they're, the, they're part of the same bank of keys controlled by this demultiplexer. So when, when we get, when uh, line zero on this demultiplexer is selected, it's going to enable the output of both Z12 and Z13. In fact, we can look here on the enable line Z13, and we see this same kind of pattern, this normally on pattern that we saw for output line 0 of the demultiplexer. And Z12, uh, the output, uh, the uh, selection line, enable line, rather, is the same. So there's this kind of a weird offish blip, but it's mostly on. So let's take a look here at F sharp. So um, the input here is on pin 14. So this is coming through from Z2, and when I press the key down, it's low, and when I release it, it's high. And what this should do is uh, it should allow what I'm putting on this pin to go through if this is low. So let's take a look at pin 13. This is the, the output of that buffer, and you can see that pretty much when that chip is enabled, the output is low. So let's take a look. There is some weird little blip going on there, like there's some activity on the, the data bus, because what I'm probing now is actually the data bus going back to the CPU. So let's take a look now at Z12. So same kind of deal. So this is the, uh, the enable line, and C1 the low C is our is our input and our output here is not not moving based on that key there's just this random little flip going on here so I think at this point we have uh, determined that Z12 uh, the tri-state buffer chip there is bad and um, We'll go ahead and replace that and see where we stand. So now with that one buffer chip changed in the keyboard electronics board, I've turned the bass back on and... And 
not only do all the notes work, but they're actually different when you play them. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to see if that affected anything with the lead synthesizer that we were having trouble with. So I revisited the lead synthesizer now that we changed that chip uh, for the keyboard electronics board. And what a difference one chip can make. So now the VCA closes, which it didn't before. And I'm always getting the correct note. It's never jumping to that really low note like it was before. Unfortunately, uh, VCO1 still doesn't work. So uh, we have a little bit of work to do, but we, we made huge progress with just one chip changed. So now let's track down this dead oscillator. Well, let's actually make sure that the oscillator is really dead. So the lead mix board here has these little test points sprinkled throughout the back. And looking at the schematics, I can see that there's test point 7 and test point 8. Uh, test point 7 is the output for oscillator number 1. And test point 8 is the output for oscillator number 2. So let's take a quick peek there and uh, verify that, that really this oscillator is dead. All right, so first I'm going to have a look at uh, oscillator. Well, first I'll set a note. Uh, and then I'm going to have a look at oscillator number two, which is test point eight here. So, do this, and set the triggering of our scope, and we see a nice sawtooth waveform being put out at the test point for oscillator two. Uh, now let's go take a look at test point seven, which should be about the same. And what we actually see is a very very, very slowly rising waveform. And let's, let's see what happens with it. So, many seconds later, it dropped back down to ground. So, what we actually have here is we have a very, very slow sawtooth wave. So, the oscillator is definitely misbehaving. Uh, the question is, now, is it getting the correct control voltage? So we'll compare the control voltage coming to oscillator 1 and oscillator 2. One thing I noticed when I was playing, if you heard that little click, uh, when oscillator 1 reset, uh, when, the, when the sawtooth dropped down on that sharp edge, you could hear a little click in the output. So I had heard that little click in the output and uh, thought it was going to be another issue that I was going to need to track down, but now it can be explained by this oscillator 1 not behaving correctly. So the control voltage comes in here um, from the CPU board. Um, it's been out of the DAC, and it goes through a couple levels of processing, and basically it comes out here on this op amp pin 1 uh, and goes into VCO 1. So we can look at it here and compare it to the, uh, the same point on oscillator 2 here, they're the same IC chip, pins 7 is the control voltage for oscillator 2 and pin 1 is the control voltage for oscillator 1 and they should be pretty similar, I mean um, not necessarily exactly the same but uh, they should be pretty similar so we'll check here if we have a problem we, uh, with the control voltage, we know to look before this Otherwise, we've now contained our problem to the VCO1 circuitry. So first we're going to take a look at the control voltage on the working oscillator. This is uh, oscillator 2, so we're going to be looking at pin 7 of this op amp chip. And I'll hit a high note, an octave lower, 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 lower. So that, that's kind of how the control voltage responds as I hit some C's going down the keyboard. Now let's take a look at pin 1, which is the control voltage for oscillator 1, and we'll do the same. And it seems to respond about the same. So the control voltage coming into oscillator 1 is correct, uh, but our output waveform is incorrect. So we now know that there is a problem somewhere within VCO1. So here's the oscillator 1 circuitry, and as you'll notice, it's made entirely of discretes. There is one IC chip, and it's a transistor array. And in the previous video, I think at part 3 of the restoration, we replaced this transistor array uh, with a brand new 3046 chip. So pretty sure that 
that all five of these transistors from this chip are good. Uh, we refurbished the sliders, so the, the, the tune slider there has been refurbished. So that pretty much only leaves um, a handful of transistors. So we have the this complementary pair of transistors here. Uh, we have a couple of JFETs here and a couple of BJT transistors here. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to um, compare what's happening on these transistors in oscillator 1 to the identical circuit down here in oscillator 2. So we don't even really need to understand this uh, for the purpose of this video to troubleshoot it because we have a working oscillator that we can compare to. So we're going to start with uh, transistor 7 and kind of work our way through the uh, through the, the transistors. So we're going to start looking at the transistors and we're going to look at the working oscillator first and then we're going to look at its complementary transistor in oscillator 1 which is broken. So uh, I said we start with transistor 7 of, of oscillator 1. The corresponding transistor on oscillator 2 is uh, Q13. Here I'm going to probe the three pins of Q13. So the first pin is uh, pretty much low. I see a couple little spikes there. The second pin, we have this uh, reverse sawtooth waveform. And the third pin is, is high. So let's take a look at the corresponding one on oscillator 1. So we have low. I don't see the spikes that I saw on the other one. The middle pin is the reverse sawtooth and uh, the third pin is high. So it looks so far okay. I'm not sure uh, about those those little spikes but because um, I'm not sure whether I'm looking at the uh, source, drain, or gate when I'm poking these. But let's move on to the next one that this uh, JFET is connected to which is uh, Q8 on oscillator 1 and Q14 on oscillator 2. So I'm going to look at the first pin there, uh, and again a reverse sawtooth. The second one is high, and the third one is a reverse sawtooth with a larger period, so uh, lower frequency. So here's that first one. second one, and third one. So let's go over to oscillator 1 and check out that corresponding JFET. So here's the first pin. Um, we have the reverse sawtooth, but you can see that there's some sweeping to it. It's not, not stable. Although now it now it's settled down. Maybe my finger was on something. Uh, the second pin here is high, and the third pin is moving very slowly down. So probably we have our reverse sawtooth uh, greatly, greatly slowed down. So this is the first difference that we've seen, the major difference that we've seen between oscillator 1 and oscillator 2. And again, there's no ICs. We change the transistor array. Uh, pretty much the only thing that can go wrong are some of these transistors, and it looks like we found a first one that, that's different. So at this point, I think it makes sense to pull the board and uh, yank out the transistors from uh, VCO1 and test them, uh, particularly this Q8 that we're seeing this, uh, this problem with. So I took the transistors out and the JFETs and whatnot from oscillator 1 and I tested them on the curve tracer and they tested okay. So then I took a look at the circuit again and I took a look for the second most likely component to have failed and I suspected uh, the Tempco. So I measured the Tempco resistors in circuit and there was a pretty big difference between the resistance in circuit resistance of uh, the Tempco and VCO1 versus VCO2. So I took them out and I will show you what they look like out of circuit. So this is the VCO2 here on the bottom, the Tempco for VCO2. 
and it's measuring 1.87 and you can see it's going up because of my my fingers touching it to hold it in place so the temperature is going up so that, that looks okay this is the one for VCO1 and you see that the resistance is really really high so it looks like it's 50 two mega ohms and eventually it just goes off my meter so this Temco resistor is actually bad and uh, and needs to be replaced if you watched my video um, where I restored the ARP Odyssey um, I proactively changed the Temco resistors and I don't know why I forgot to do it with this Quadra when I had that board out but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to replace both the, the Temco for VCO1 and VCO2 with the new Temco and I have these Tempco resistors available on my website, synthchaser.com. And if you want to replace all of the ones in your Quadra, you'd need five of them. So one for each voltage-controlled oscillator. So you need one for the base VCO, VCO1, and VCO2 of the lead synthesizer. And then each 4075 voltage-controlled filter submodule has one of these in it. So there's a total of five. So I'm going to go ahead and replace these two for the lead synthesizer. VCOs and then we'll put the board back in and test it out. And by replacing the Tempcos with this larger package I was able to mount it a little higher up so I could have it make contact with this little piece of copper that they have bonding these uh, transistors, complementary transistors that make up the exponential converter. So this should provide better temperature stability uh, than the way the old one was mounted on the board. It was in close proximity to the exponential converters transistors but it wasn't it wasn't touching so this is it's not the best contact but it's it's better than it was before so it's it's going to be better thermally coupled. So with the Tempcos changed out now oscillator ones come back to life. <laughs> Like the ARP Odyssey, this is duophonic, so you can play two notes with a lead synthesizer at the same time. Right now it's horribly out of tune because I haven't calibrated anything yet. But we have brought VCO1 back to life and I can continue testing and seeing uh, where we stand. So in this video we've made really good progress. We've gone from a dead, non-responsive quadra to a now mostly working quadra. We identified and replaced a bad CPU chip that rendered the whole instrument dead. We repaired a problem in the keyboard electronics that broke the bass and the lead synthesizer sections. And we repaired a dead oscillator 1 on the lead synth. Now all four sections of the synthesizer are up and running. I still see some issues that need to be repaired, not quite as major as the ones that we did in this video and the synth needs to be calibrated so we're going to continue our work in the next video if you're not already subscribed to my channel please be sure to do so so you don't miss out on the next part this has been the synth chaser from synthchaser.com thanks for watching and have a great day